Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. I am Stephanie Hayden, Director of Austin Public Health. The department's mission's mission is to prevent disease, promote health, and protect, protect the well-being of our community. The department began working on the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, in December of 2019. During that time, the city followed our disaster plans in order to help us proceed with a coordinated response. Our plan has five phases. Phase one is a person under monitoring. Phase two is a person under investigation. Phase three is a confirmed case with no person-to-person -person activity. And phase four is limited person-to-person -person spread. The Austin Public Health activated our department Operation Command Center on February 5th to allow an enhanced response coordination. Our epidemiologist and prepared unit operates a on-call 24-7 on-call pager which healthcare professionals and the general public can report suspected public health emergencies. The department staff that are working in this area have responded to several outbreaks including H1N1 and Ebola. We will continue to put the health and safety of our community first. At this time, I will turn over to Dr. Mark Escott. He is the Interim Health Authority and Medical Director. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, and I just wanna say thank you to the people behind me, as well as our state and federal partners uh, this has been a community effort. This has been a government effort. Uh, and our evidence from, from China, from the joint mission of the WHO, uh, tells us that an all-government, all-community effort is what's necessary for us to respond and combat this new threat. The, the fact is we've cha uh, faced many threats over the past several decades. That includes the threat of Ebola, H1N1, uh, West Nile, and other uh, communicable diseases that we see in the community every day. Uh, I, I will say that, that today the threat of community spread in Austin remains low. However, we are prepared for that to happen here. Uh, you know, as we've heard from the CDC, from the DSHS, it's not a matter of if, but when. And we are actively prepared. We are enhancing our preparedness. And we're doing that through engagement with stakeholders. That includes hospitals, that includes physicians, that includes clinicians, schools, churches, and all members of our community so that we can effectively together combat this virus. Uh, as a part of that preparation, uh, it's important to remember that at this stage, as Stephanie said, we're in phase two, which means we have person or persons under investigation. This is a normal process. This is an expected process. This is a process that's happened more than 75 times across the state over the past six weeks. In all of those cases in other parts of the state, those tests have been negative. The tests here are still pending, and we expect to have more information later today or tomorrow on that testing. This is a normal process. It doesn't mean somebody has the disease. It means the disease is one possibility, and it's an important possibility to exclude in certain patients who meet the criteria uh, for CDC testing. Um, I will say that, that in addition to the uh, mechanisms that Stephanie mentioned, we have activated partial activation of our EOC here in the city of Austin and Travis County to help us enhance the planning process. That brings additional people in to work on specific plans for nursing homes, for schools, for churches and other uh, aspects of the community, particularly right now focused on those individuals who are more vulnerable to, to this disease. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I've convened an expert advisory panel. This panel is composed of a dozen or more physicians from around our community and around the state, really. These are experts in infectious diseases, pediatrics, emergency medicine, internal medicine. It also includes representatives who are physicians from higher education and from public schools. 
This group together uh, got together last night for the first time to, uh, to form and to talk about, in particular, our evaluation and concerns regarding mass gatherings uh, for the Spring Festival, including South by Southwest, uh, as well as other associated activities. The, um, it's important for us to remember at this stage that we are actively evaluating mass gatherings on a daily basis and have been over the past several weeks. Right now, there is no evidence that closing South by Southwest or other activities is going to make this community safer. We are constantly monitoring that situation. We've asked this group to evaluate that. Uh, and if there's any evidence that our community will be safer by closing down public events, we will do that. We expect in the future that there may be modifications based upon the threat of this disease. That could be modifications to public gatherings, that could be modifications to church practices or school attendance. But the question is, are we there now? Uh, we met again last night uh, with that group. That group has asked for additional information because as expected, different venues, different parts of the festival are likely to pose different levels of risk. And what they want is more information about the current mitigation strategies and what other options are for uh, providing further mitigation, meaning how can we further decrease the risk? I will tell you that one of the concerns is if we shut down or make the recommend recommendation to shut down South by Southwest, people will still continue to come here. They will travel, they'll do what they were normally going to do, but without that organizational structure that South by Southwest provides. I will say that all along, South by Southwest has been extremely responsive to requests for mitigation strategies. That so far has included increasing availability of hand washing, increasing availability of hand sanitizers, messaging to attendees, uh, signs placed in venues and other locations in the convention center and throughout the festival to remind folks of the importance of personal hygiene. In addition to that, South by Southwest just this weekend agreed to screen employees and volunteers to make sure that they themselves uh, do not have a febrile illness or a fever uh, prior, to, prior to working. Uh, it is likely that this expert panel will advise uh, and recommend further strategies to mitigate risk. Uh, obviously, as the number of people increases at a particular venue, and the density of that venue increases, the risk of spread of infection of COVID-19, influenza, or anything else is going to increase. Uh, so part of that discussion is where is, the, where is the risk the most and how can we mitigate that risk? Um, certainly, as you've all seen in the past, uh, we're particularly concerned about those over the age of 65 and with other comorbidities. I think for public gatherings in general at this stage, those individuals need to be more cautious than others due to the risk of influenza and COVID-19 now and into the future. Um, it's, I can't stress enough the importance of the personal hygiene message. It's not a vaccine, it's not a medical treatment, but it is evidence-based effective at managing and limiting the spread of this disease. This disease is bad, okay? It's, it's probably more deadly than flu, but it's not Ebola. It's not SARS, it's not MERS. The likelihood now is that the case fatality rate is less than 1%. When we look at the evidence from, uh, from China outbreak, after February 1st, the case fatality rate is 0.7%. Outside of Wuhan, the case fatality rate is 0.7%. The expert panel last night had consensus in the fact that it's likely that the actual case fatality rate is lower than that because it's likely that there is much more disease being spread than we're aware of and that have been confirmed by tests. When you add that number to the denominator, it substantially may decrease that case fatality rate. Uh, I'm going to end there and ask uh, Judge Eckhart to the podium. Thank you, Judge. Thank you so much, Dr. Escott. 
uh, we can have full confidence in our public health professionals and expertise. Uh, Dr. Escott has been tremendous at um, being at the head of our public health response. And I do want to assure folks that even when we are not in cold, flu, and COVID-19 season, our public health professionals review every one of our mass gatherings to review them for public safety purposes and to make sure that there are plans in place. Uh, I'm grateful to Dr. Escott and our entire public health team, uh, including Stephanie Hayden, uh, Sherry Fleming over at Travis County, as well as many others in our first responder community. Um, for reviewing all of those plans with regard to mass gatherings, and also to Dr. Escott for further enriching our public health um, review with uh, deeper expertise coming out of our hospitals and medical community. Um, we are reviewing all the evidence continually. We have been for some time, and we are taking appropriate actions. Um, I would ask the community uh, and, and strongly suggest that panic will weaken us. So let's do what our mothers taught us. Let's cover our sneezes, let's wash our hands, and let's be good neighbors. It's extremely important that we uh, are calm and that we let evidence-based uh, decision-making uh, dictate our actions inside of our homes with our family members, with our friends, with our coworkers, and with our neighbors, whether we're in the grocery store, whether we are at our child's school, or whether we are in our workplace. So keep calm and carry on, y'all. And remember what your mama taught you. I'm gonna close us out here and then uh, open it up for, for, for questions. Uh, so that you can ask those of our, of our medical professionals. Uh, I want the community to know that uh, uh, everyone here and the hundreds of other people involved in evaluating this situation hear the concern uh, that has been expressed by many people in the community. Everyone should know that the primary and only consideration uh, right now is ensuring uh, as best we can the, the safety and health uh, of the people that, that live in our community. And that is the, the guiding principle for, for all of the evaluations. As our public health officers said, at this point, uh, there's no evidence to suggest that canceling South by Southwest makes the community safer. That's been the analysis over the last few weeks, but I want the community to know that that question is being reevaluated and reconsidered multiple times every day and will continue to be reevaluated. If that changes, if the conclusion and recommendation from our expert, professional, medical folks changes, then we will immediately implement the recommendation that comes from that panel. Everyone should know that the people involved in that decision are our public health department, our public health officers, both with the city and the county. Uh, but it also includes an advisory panel that has representation from all three of the major health providers and health systems in our city as some of the, of the best medical minds uh, in our community that are taking a look at and continually evaluating this, 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 this question to make sure that we are doing everything we can uh, to keep folks safe. And then I just want to reiterate, because it's really important to, to remember, that the evidence and the data is telling us that it is effective if we wash our hands, if we bow to one another, uh, or, or do an elbow bump rather than, than, to, than to shake hands, uh, and that if we're sick, we don't go to school or don't go to work. Uh, we take those steps right now. The evidence is demonstrating that really is the best and most important thing that we should be doing. I want the community to know that these decisions are being made by our medical professionals and that no corporation or South By or anybody else has a seat at that table because we're only motivated 
by making sure that we do what we can to keep the community safe. And with that, then, um, uh, we'll open it up for questions. Um, I, have, I, have, I have a question for um, Dr. Escott and Director Hawley. Um, I, I'm so sorry, Dr. Director Hayden. Um, can, just to clarify for people in the community, from a, from a health perspective, does having an event like South by Southwest in the community put Austin at an increased risk for COVID-19? Like, is inherently having a festival here in Austin something that increases our risk or, or likelihood <coughs> for uh, transmission? So it's, that's a challenging question. And it's challenging because the evidence is not clear uh, that holding large events overall changes the magnitude of outbreaks. Uh, there is some evidence that it may shift it sooner than it may have been otherwise. And that's one of the, the key things that, that this expert panel is evaluating is what is the increased risk by having that festival here? And can we mitigate that risk by enforcing these hand hygiene messages, ensuring that hand sanitizer and, and hand washing is available, and possibly increasing the distance between people at venues. Uh, this is what I was talking about earlier about, uh, you know, some venues are going to be lower risk than other venues. As the crowds grow and the people get closer together, the risk is going to increase for transmission of COVID-19 potentially, and certainly influenza, because we're still in the midst of a significant influenza season. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's multidimensional, this, this challenge, and is one that is, is complicated. I, I'll tell you quite honestly, we're also concerned that uh, b because South by Southwest has been so engaged in helping us mitigate that if we shut it down, that people will come to this community anyway, they're going to go to restaurants and bars and public gatherings anyway, but we won't have all of this. We won't have the messaging. We won't have the hand sanitizer. We won't have those additional mitigation steps that South by Southwest has really been partners with us on. Uh, so that is one consideration that, that has been discussed uh, with, with this group. Uh, I, I will also say that, that as public health officials and clinicians, we are also concerned about not the economic impact itself, but the repercussions from that. Because health is a multidimensional thing. It is also related to having a job and earning a wage and be able to afford food that is fresh. It's, a, it, it's being able to afford health insurance. And th this means that canceling large events uh, that impact the economy that, that, that may lead to job loss has some downstream effects that are hard to quantify. But it's something that we are actively engaged in discussing in that expert panel. We know that in One at a time, folks. I'll call on you right here, CBS. We know that how close quarters almost every event at South by Southwest is. We've all been there. We've all been at the concerts. We've all been at the film screenings and the red carpets. You're going to have close contact. That's a given. What can be done to effectively lessen that close contact? Uh, and, and those are strategies that we're looking at right now. Uh, it, uh, it may be that the, the panel would suggest that we need to have social distancing, which may mean decreasing the number of people allowed into venues uh, or other mitigation strategies. But that is a key question that, uh, that we're investigating. How tightly packed are these places at the various venues and various festivals, and does it represent an unreasonable risk if it's too tight that, uh, that it, it poses a substantial increased risk? No. Are they still being monitored? Uh, the, the individuals under investigation, we're not going to discuss further details about them. Uh, I will say that uh, they, they are monitored uh, by us or public uh, or hospital systems uh, if they're in the hospital, and they will continue to be monitored until we have results back. Brad. Dr. Escott, can you tell us a little more about the city's policy and procedure for monitoring those individuals and inspecting those individuals where they're being housed? So uh, for not only coronavirus, but other outbreaks like this as well, what's the city's policy with where those people stay? Uh, so it, it depends on, on the situation. Generally speaking, 
the, the people stay at their residence if they don't require hospitalization. In that circumstance, I issue a control order, which is an order with instructions. You know, you may not leave your home, you may not go grocery shopping or go to public venues, uh, and you have to be compliant with monitoring uh, with public health officials. Uh, our epidemiologists and, and team contact individuals twice a day if they're under monitoring. They check their symptoms, they check their temperatures, and then continue that for the duration of their 14-day period in this circumstance. And if in their home they can't stay isolated from other people, like if they're in a dorm or if they live with other people, what then happens to them? Uh, so part of that process is evaluating those, those social factors. We do have social workers who are available that we consult with when those challenges happen so that we can work through the details, ensure that they have a safe place to stay, that they have food, that they have availability of health care. Um, what would have to happen for South by Southwest to be considered unsafe? And then how does that cancellation work? Is it something that you guys recommend to the city and they go from there? Uh, so the, the process is, is a complex one because it has to do with the overall threat, the global threat, the national threat, as well as our local threat. So those are the dynamics that we're constantly evaluating to determine if the risk changes. Uh, and again, uh, part of that assessment is, is that social distancing piece and the mitigation steps uh, that uh, are recommended by the expert panel. Okay, Doctor, the uh, federal government is expected to send out more testing kits around the country this week. So which of our area hospitals will have testing kits and how many is our area expected to get, especially in light of the fact that we seem to be going ahead with South by Southwest? Uh, the only local testing that will be available is at the uh, DSHS lab here in Austin. Uh, that will be only at the state facility. There won't be any hospitals uh, locally that will have ac direct access to that test. So how many people would be administering those tests then? I don't have those figures. Over here in the back. Hi. Um, Dr. Escott, isn't it true that uh, for people coming to the, to the festival, we probably wouldn't know until days, weeks after they've actually left town that maybe they were infected and had spread the disease. And so what, what's, how are y'all responding to that scenario? And I have a question also for the mayor, which is, <coughs> is the city doing anything to help people who cannot just stay home from work, who don't have that option? Uh, so I'll answer the first question. Uh, part of, of the process, if a case does happen, it doesn't matter if it's South by Southwest or somewhere in the community, we have a team of experts who are epidemiologists who do contact investigations. They will identify where the person was, when they were there, and who they were around. In the event, like we saw with the measles case recently, if we can't identify those individuals because they traveled through a public place, then we'll make a public announcement. If you were in this location during these time frames, please contact us if you develop symptoms. So we have multiple different uh, ways to, to do that contact, con contact tracing. Uh, but it, we certainly depend upon our experts uh, who have lots of experience doing that. So I think that, that, that we're being advised by the, by the medical uh, expert, experts uh, that uh, the steps that we can take at this point for people in our community who, who can't stay home and are heading to their job and heading to school Number one is to say right now that's exactly what people should be doing. Uh, there's 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 not a there's not a risk associated with 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 going on with your lives and you should. That said, with this virus, especially, but as with all viruses, uh, we really need to be spending uh, a lot more and, and concerted attention right now on these steps that are on the board to to wash our hands and not shake hands and 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 make sure that. Uh, to the degree we can, we get treatment and stay home when we are sick. People should stay home when they're sick and they, and they shouldn't go to work. We're also taking a look at and making sure that we are looking at the places where people are most vulnerable. So in nursing homes where people are experiencing homelessness, uh, and other places where we know that we have populations that might be more prone to have compromised uh, immune systems uh, to make sure that we provide extra protection or extra mitigation. And that's part of what the, the health expert professionals are, are looking at now. And for medical experts, how confident are you that three positive test results would ensure allowing someone an under observation back into the community safely? Uh, that's an excellent question, and I think that, uh, you know, 
part of a novel virus is that we learn things along the way. Um, I, I think that uh, that the, the the three sets of testing is the best evidence we have right now, um, and I, I I think that the CDC is going to continue to evaluate that process uh, as we go. Do y'all have triggers or guidelines for the coronavirus in what would lead to you know closing city offices, shutting down South by, closing schools? Has that been created yet? Uh, so again, we have a a pandemic infectious disease plan. Uh, so that's we're in the process of modifying it uh, and continuing modifying it as we get new evidence regarding this particular coronavirus. Um, generally speaking, when we have evidence of sustained person-to-person -person spread in our community then we think about closing schools uh, and making other substantial modifications to our regular operations. Currently, if we have an outbreak in a school, we may recommend to the school for a flu. We may recommend that they close it down for a day or two, do a deep clean, let the, the, let the transmission cycle break, and then reopen. Uh, in some circumstances, CDC recommends uh, that increasing distance between students in the classroom may be a, an a effective option at limiting the spread. Uh, so those are, are some of the plans that we are refining. We're bringing in uh, other experts, uh, outside experts, as well as our planning folks to really hone down on how we're going to tailor that pandemic plan existing to this new, new virus. Uh, CDC says it's up to local health departments to decide whom to test. So what's the criteria? Uh, so there's there's a number of criteria. Uh, some of those have to do with travel history and the presence uh, of uh, clinical syndrome also. Uh, but they have loosened the reins a little bit. And that means if we have somebody with a substantial infection that we don't have another explanation for and um, they uh, and we've ruled out other things, that they will accept those cases for testing for COVID-19. Last question over here. Indeed has said employees should work from home. Do you feel like this is something you would like to see other major companies in Austin do as well? I, I don't think we're at that stage right now in Austin of giving instructions for people routinely to be working at home. Uh, obviously, uh, IT-related companies, it's much easier to do that because that may be part of their work practices already. In the city of Austin, uh, we encourage some activity being done uh, remotely to decrease our, our carbon emissions. Uh, it's something that folks need to think about, and we've encouraged businesses to think about that continuity of operation plan. We do that for flu as well, because you know we see outbreaks of flu going through businesses that sub substantially impact their ability to to continue. So these are things that companies should be considering, that local government should be considering, and that schools need to be considering. How are we going to respond to ensure that we continue to provide the services? Uh, that we currently do in the event that there's an outbreak or a cluster of, of disease. All right, thank you guys, appreciate it. Thank you.